والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent and Merciful, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I send peace and blessings to all of the prophets and messengers who came from the beginning of time and especially to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, his family, his companions and all those who called to his way to the Day of Judgment. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and blessings be upon you. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent his followers in all directions. And Islam within 100 years was able to go far to the east to China and far to the west all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And it is reported that one of his companions, Uqba ibn Nafi'a radiallahu an, penetrated the great Sahara Desert. And from his time, caravans were going from the north across the desert and into West Africa, the great empire of gold. It was from that region in the Bambak uh, mines, the Bodhi mines, that gold was being mined and being sent north. And this became the greatest area of gold production on the face of the planet Earth. The empire of Mali was the base for this gold production. And so Mali became a fabulous empire right from the beginning when it was established. Muslims were able to not only consolidate themselves, but they were able to move uh, from east to the west, north and south, because of the facility of having this wealth and the need for people to come into the area. Of the great leaders of Mali who were known as Mansa or Amir, Mansa Kenken Musa, who ruled from around 1312 to uh, uh, 1337, was probably the most celebrated of the great emirs of Mali. He consolidated Mali. He made his empire a part of the lands of Islam. He encouraged Islamic learning and he turned his country into a vast multi-ethnic empire. He built Friday masjids, Juma masjids everywhere he could. Not only did he build the mosque but he established prayer amongst the people. In the map here, we see um, Musa, Mansa Musa on the right with gold in his hand. On the left, we see a Berber who is bringing um, goods from across the desert. This map was made by a European cartographer. And um, it shows the respect that they had for Mansa Musa at that time. And so Mansa Musa encouraged Islamic learning. And it is reported that he was very serious about instituting the fiqh of Imam Malik ibn Anas, rahimahullah, one of the great four imams of Islamic jurisprudence. In 1324, Mansa Musa made a very important decision. He made his intention to go to pilgrimage to Mecca. And so he started on his journey. But in the tradition of Mali, he didn't just go by himself. He carried with him somewhere between 60 to 72,000 people across the Sahara Desert. They carried so much gold with them that they changed the economy of every country that they reached. It is reported that they had close to 15,000 camels laden with gold, 8,000 soldiers, and this huge moving nation going from city to city changing the economy, developing relationships, and <clears throat> Mansa Musa would build a mosque everywhere he stopped. 
when they finally reached north into Egypt, they found Bahari Mamluks ruling Egypt at the time, and the Mamluk leaders honored him and gave him a special escort to take him from Cairo into Mecca. And so Mansa Musa, with a huge delegation, then came into Mecca at that time. You could imagine the Hujjaj from Mali probably made up about 95% of the pilgrims uh, that year. And he had a profound effect upon the people of Hijaz in Saudi Arabia and the people in Egypt. Mansa Musa returned to Timbuktu and gave special attention to this city on the Niger. He was supported by the scholars of the region, and it is said that from Saudi Arabia itself, a Sidi Abdurrahman at Tamimi left the Hejaz, Mecca, and Medina area and traveled um, into the area of Timbuktu and the Niger River. And when he found the level of scholarship in this area, he went to Fes and learned more about the Maliki fiqh, and then he returned to Timbuktu and he lived all of his life in this region in West Africa. He felt that the real knowledge in the Islamic world was there, not in Mecca and in Medina. What was Timbuktu? What type of people were living there? And what is the importance of this uh, famous city to the history of Islam and to the world? There's probably no other word in the English language that gives you a meaning of remoteness and distance than Timbuktu. If you say to a person, I'm going to Timbuktu, then that uh, gives you the understanding you're going to the moon, to a vast expanse, somewhere in the remote distance. But the reality was, um, to many explorers, Timbuktu actually represented a land of great riches. It was a land of gold, and some of the explorers actually thought that the streets were lined with gold and that the women had so much gold on their bodies they could hardly move. For Muslim travelers, rulers, scholars from Morocco to Persia, Timbuktu had another meaning. It was the starting point for the Hujjaj, for the pilgrims to Mecca, and it was also the center of some of the finest Islamic scholarship of the Middle Ages. Timbuktu was founded in the 11th century by the Tawareg people who lived in the Sahara Desert. And the Tawaregs are known for the men who cover their faces with blue and black turbans, constantly covering themselves. And they were part of the Berber groupings who would take you through the, the great desert of the Sahara, the ones who had the strength and the patience to overcome the terrible heat and the lack of water. Timbuktu was actually a few miles up from the Niger River. Because um, the Niger River um, was a place where um, during the flood season there was a lot of stagnated water. And so when the Tuaregs would come um, with their animals, they would find themselves um, uh, dying from disease, surrounded by mosquitoes, and so they made their base just to the north. The city was actually founded by a woman, and um, her name was Tin Abutut. And so from this name, Tin Abutut, comes Timbuktu. She founded the city by digging a well and um, making a base for people to be able to leave the stagnated area of, of the river and go to a very um, dry, flat area, not too far away from the traffic going along the river. And so with a small well and a small settlement established by a woman of Islam, a great city develops again. This city was developed precisely where the Niger River flows northward into the southern edge of the desert. Timbuktu is a natural meeting point for different peoples, the Songhai, the Mande, the Wangara, the Fulanis, the Tuaregs, the Arabic-speaking people. It is a natural meeting place for people coming out of the desert and moving along into the river area. It is even said that Timbuktu is the place where the camel met the canoe. 
in that area, in Timbuktu and also in other famous cities along the Niger River, salt and goods were being carried from the north and they were traded for the gold coming up from the south. But Timbuktu also attracted scholars from all over West Africa, from the Sahara region and many parts of the Islamic world. The salt coming into the city came from Tagazza in the north and the gold came from the famous Bode Bambuk mine area. A famous historian, Leo Africanus, in the 16th century, when he wrote about Timbuktu, he had the following to say. There are many judges, doctors, and clerics here, all receiving good salaries from King Askia Muhammad of the state of Songhai. He pays great respect to men of learning. There is a great demand for books, and more profit is made from the trade in books than any other line of business. This is a very important statement because we see Timbuktu coming into its own around the 12th century and then by the, the 16th century it reaches such a high level. If you look at London and Paris and, and many of the great European cities, you will find that they did not develop themselves to that level. It was only Andalusia, the Muslim cities in Andalusia. But if you look at Europe and other parts of the world, you'll see that Timbuktu rivaled the great universities all around the planet. It is said that by the mid-16th century, Timbuktu was a center of learning, a center of scholarship, and a center of Islamic spirituality. There were over 150 Quranic schools, and there were three major universities, the Sankode University, Jingare Bayer University, and Sidi Yahya University. The city at that time had over 100,000 people, and it is said that in the Sankore University itself, there were 25,000 students. Now this is something that is hard to understand today. It is hard to come to grips with, with the negative propaganda about the African continent and about the level of scholarship of people below the Sahara. But Timbuktu was a fabulous city and a city that people wanted to reach who were coming from many different parts of the world. It is also said that in Timbuktu, the city was so organized and so developed that there were 26 establishments for tailor scholars. Each tailor scholar had over 100 employees. And so, thriving business, cloth is being manufactured, clothing is being made. So Timbuktu is, is, is moving out literature, moving clothing, covering the bodies of people, also teaching purity, connecting the people of the south, south of the Niger River, with the people north of the Sahara Desert. It was a port city on a sea of sand. It was a fabulous city. And up until that point, it was 100% Muslim. It is also stated that in the 16th century, the people of Timbuktu were totally literate. 100% of the people, man, woman, and child, male and female, could all read the Arabic language. Let us take a break for a moment and come back to hear more about the fabulous city of Timbuktu. <laughs> Welcome to this new episode of Focus Point. The new generation is has the good the habit of reading more than before. The Jewish question was named basically the problem of Jews who lost their function in society. The city of Timbuktu was a fabulous city of learning, scholarship, and of wealth, a port city on a sea of sand. Although the name in many cultures 
gives you an impression of remoteness, of distance, of being somewhere where there is no civilization. Timbuktu, especially by the 16th century, was the height of civilization on the African continent and could, ri could rival cities and places of universities anywhere in the world. The scholars of Timbuktu had reached such a level that when scholars came from Mecca and Medina and Cairo and other places, they would stay there usually for the rest of their life. The level that the scholars reached was one that up until today, um, sc that scholars and educators are still coming to grips with. If you look at the Timbuktu educational system, and this is very important because this system affected uh, Muslims throughout West Africa and even eventually came into the Americas with the scholars in slavery. The first level on the Timbuktu uh, educational system was the primary level. At that point, the young student would memorize the Qur'an and would become familiar with the Arabic language. They would learn the, the, the bases of uh, Islamic sciences, but especially they would focus on the grammar, upon literature, until they became uh, uh, powerful in the use of Arabic and able to read the Qur'an in any part and understand what they are reading. The second level was um, the secondary part, wherein they studied the Islamic sciences with more depth, they studied grammar, they studied tafsir, commentary of the Qur'an, they studied the hadith, the sayings and traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they studied fiqh, or jurisprudence, and especially they focused on the Maliki uh, uh, fiqh that was used throughout West Africa and North Africa. But at the same time, along with their study of Islamic sciences, or what today people would term as religious sciences, Islamic science for the people of Timbuktu covered every single aspect of academia. So the students on the secondary level would also study mathematics, geography, history, physics, astronomy, chemistry, science, sciences of different types, and they put a special uh, emphasis on the study of ihsan. A and this is righteousness in Islam, whereby the person is able to benefit from the sciences and put it into their life. The third and highest level of uh, study was the specialized area. Today we would call it graduate studies. And this is where the students would sit under renowned ulama, renowned scholars of different disciplines. And uh, if the person, for instance, was uh, focusing on tafsir, he would sit with a renowned scholar of tafsir who would take him through the subtleties of the Qur'an and help him to understand what was taught by scholars throughout the Muslim world. They also focused not only on taking in knowledge, but practicing knowledge. And you could call it um, the, the, the system of mulazama. And mulazama was that you would live with your teacher and you would also um, uh, take in his character. So you would live with him and you would also work with him. You would trade with him. You would eat your meals with him. You would learn not only from the knowledge in his mind, but you would learn from his character, from what actually came out in his life itself. This mulazama system was so important that it was practiced by people all throughout West Africa and in many parts of the world. So that when a person came out of the specialized study underneath a scholar, he was given ijazah. He was given special permission that he could teach um, this subject uh, uh, to other students. He had to pass a test whereby not only he memorized the basic mutun or the texts, but he could explain what was in the metan or the text of a particular subject, and he could give you the subtleties of the subject. He could take it to a higher level and actually go into the philosophy of the subject. And so the students coming out of Timbuktu were masters of their disciplines. And when they went to Morocco and other parts of the Muslim world, they actually found difficulty in relating some of their concepts uh, to the people because the people were generally looking at the text and not going above the text and looking at 
some of the higher levels uh, of science and discipline. And so, amongst the great scholars uh, in, in Timbuktu were people whose tradition um, lasted all the way up until the present day. A few of the names of uh, scholars in Timbuktu uh, that are very well known within the history books in West Africa, Mudibo Muhammad al Kabori, who was a Fulani man and who was known to be a great judge, a great uh, knowledgeable person in Maliki fiqh. There was also a person named al Qadi al Hajj, who was from Walata, a city uh, north of Timbuktu. He became the chief Qadi or the chief judge uh, of, t of Timbuktu and set the trend for judges into the future. Muhammad Bagayugu, a Sudani al Wangadi. He was a person from the Wangara who were Mandinka, coming out of uh, Mali, and a famous scholar who influenced people within his society and whose generations later became also great ulama. From amongst the generations coming out of these scholars, probably the most famous was Sheikh Ahmed Baba Asudani. Ahmed Baba Asudani, rahimahullah, was a scholar who surpassed all of the scholars of his time. He wrote 60 texts. He especially focused on aqidah, grammar, history, and fiqh. And it is said in 1593, an invasion force came into Timbuktu from Morocco. They crossed the desert using weapons, and they succeeded in conquering Timbuktu and driving many of the scholars out of the city. Ahmed Baba, Sheikh Ahmed Baba, was captured uh, by the Moroccan force and he was taken high into Morocco. By the time he reached Fez, now imagine this scholar being taken and he starts in chains. By the time he reaches Morocco, he was out of his chains and he was giving lessons to all of the soldiers. When he reached Morocco, and the people of Morocco realized the level of this man's Islamic knowledge. He became the leading scholar in the nation. He was called the Standard of Standards. And he uh, was able to author many books. He was able to produce students from Morocco who still recognize his uh, achievements up until today. But he became homesick for Timbuktu. And the end of his story is, that he finally was allowed to leave Morocco. He returned to Timbuktu, where he taught and practiced his faith for the rest of his life. And so Ahmed Baba goes down into the annals of history as being one of the most important scholars of his time. And we find within the tarikhs, the special histories, Tarikh al-Sudan, the history of the Sudan by Sidi Abdurrahman al-Sa'di, this records the history of Timbuktu and the region. Tarikh al-Fattash by Mahmoud Kati. This also reports the history of the people in that region. Asadi, in his text, brings a very interesting report. This is going back now to around the 16th century. And he said that one of his relatives had a problem with his eye. So he went to Jenne, which is a city just uh, down the river from Timbuktu, he went to Jenne and they performed a complicated eye operation, his cataract, and it was successful. So people in Timbuktu in the 16th century were not only masters of Islamic sciences, but they were also masters of medicine, of optics, and many other disciplines. The importance of Timbuktu is not only um, significant for the past, it represents to us a great uh, uh, height in Islamic civilization. But it is also important to us presently today. And that is because in recent years, about three years ago, the president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, traveled to Mali on a diplomatic mission. He was taken there during his break period. He, he, he visited the city of Timbuktu, and he finds in the city of Timbuktu the Ahmed Baba Institute. Now in the Ahmed Baba Institute, the President of South Africa, 
finds 15,000 Arabic textbooks still in readable form. He's in shock when he sees these textbooks and he realizes that Timbuktu and the Ahmed Baba Center needs not only the attention of South Africa, but it needs the attention of the whole of Africa. So therefore, the project of preserving the documents in Timbuktu has become the prime cultural project for the African Union. It is now looked upon as the chief repository of African culture. It is also looked upon by Muslims as one of the centers of learning where great texts are reported. Some of these books, some of these writings are still very legible. The desert is encroaching on Timbuktu. The termites are having their toll, taking a toll upon the textbooks. Dryness is making um, the paper brittle. But the Timbuktu documents have withstood the test of time. The Timbuktu documents are now being uh, photographed. They are now being put into digital libraries. They are being preserved. And it is the hope of the uh, African Union, it is the prayer of the Muslims that the heritage of Timbuktu be saved for the world. Another interesting uh, spin-off coming out of Timbuktu is that there are people in America, there is the Timbuktu Educational Foundation and other groups in America who are actually going into the ghettos of America and using the Timbuktu methodology as a means of structuring a system for children who are coming from a, a, a low disadvantaged background and helping them to come into the light of learning. The mulazama system, where the teacher is not only giving information but also teaching character. This is the importance of Timbuktu. It, is the it was the center of learning of the past and the light is still showing up until today. Again, we are unlocking untold stories from world history. And I leave you with this thought, and in a state of peace. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.